24. I guess this would be year 58, if you go by the calendar the Satanists use. Year 58 of the year of fire or age of fire. There's so many ages and aeons and epochs and millennia, whatever name you want to call it, the new age. Um, but they all kind of point to the same thing: this great transformation we're living through as they change the set design and paint over the old world order and call it the new one. If you look at the screen, there's an image of witches by moonlight gathered around a launching rocket with the pentagram on it. And that's pretty much the story of NASAtology. You know, it's not just a space religion like Scientology with better special effects. It's actually the facade. It's the facade for something that you might call a pagan or a mystery school. Yep, the Egyptian mystery schools have been rebranded and merged with science fiction as has our reality. But it's important to keep in mind what's behind it all. I had an interesting conversation with Crypto K yesterday. Not a crypto scammer. Crypto Kubrology, as in Stanley Kubrick. And this is a channel that I followed on Twitter. And I thought, you know, we, I reached out to him a while ago. And his Twitter account is described as a, quote, useful methodology for deconstructing cinema history and synchronicity. And if you haven't heard this, it's on the Infinite Plane radio channel, but I'm going to upload it into the archives. I've been getting some favorable feedback, and a lot of people do want to, in fact... Hey, look, we're live on X. A lot of people do want to hear more from him, and I am going to reach out to him again after I've read through his substack. We are live on X. The channel is IPS Think Tank. And right now you can see uh, about 12 people live there, and I rarely interact with that. It's not my main channel, it's a backup channel, but I converted it into a live stream. So if you want to listen live on X, and I believe it also archives there by default. So there's another backup. The channel is IPS Think Tank. I'll have to make it a point to share that link later. Let me catch up on comments here. Oswaldo says, great convo. Okay, you were there. I, I did premiere it live. Now, what we talked about is what we talk about here. But it's... And look, I didn't finish watching Asteroid City... And I'm disappointed now. I didn't go alone. And a lot of times when I watch terrible movies or movies that I'm just watching for propaganda analysis, I try to go alone because I have a notebook and it's homework for me. I try not to bring people who are hoping to be entertained. And I was not able to watch the whole movie. I had to walk out before it was done. And apparently Margot Robbie's in it, which would have added a whole new element to my interpretation. So I'm glad I spoke them. I have to watch it again now. And the movie is sort of directly about Kubrick and about how we live in a movie Kubrick directed that we refer to as the 20th century, that he is a top-tier metascriptor. And our conversation kind of veers into this realm where it appears to be that there are elements here of genuine synchronicity or magic or some other element. And that's what we're working on. We're working on an explanation, the best possible theory. And... For the time being, I have ruled out the supernatural. However, we have to keep in mind, you know, that we're dealing with something that does incorporate that which we would refer to as magic, however you define it. So the conversation is interesting, and I hope to follow up on it with more soon. Okay, so we are joined here by the HBIC, Diana South, Thirst for Truth, Zin Bellis, Copacetic, Elephant Tusks. Diana South says, the last show last night was great. I hope there'll be a sequel. Yeah, we'll make it a, a repeated theme because, you know, he's focused on Kubrick, but it's not just Kubrick. There are other metascriptors and similar patterns. I mean, we were kind of touching on the subject of 113, the number all over Pixar. 311, 113, the significance there. 
go into this for hours. And the movie Wall-E and the connection to 113 where it's explained is very significant. But we're, we're talking about how even in Wall-E, you have this conspicuous number that's kind of analogous to Kubrick and his 237 and the significance of the number 237 in all of this. But the movie Wall-E has a character called Otto, the autopilot AI that drives the spaceship, and it's analogous to Hell 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Fascinating connections, and he makes this great link between John D. and Stanley Kubrick and the monolith, and John D.'s scrying mirror, which gets really intriguing to me because I think that the personage we know of as John D. is extremely significant in, I think, the formation of our worldview. The term British Empire was coined by this astrologer, astrologer magician, spy, creator of this ritual magic that's practiced in the West. If you do Wicca, or if you're familiar with it, or even with any kind of ritual magic from Crowley or New Ageism, it ultimately stems from a very specific worldview, a methodology, the idea of man as a microcosm who can influence the realm. It really stems from John Dee's ritual magic. And what's interesting about his whole concept is that he describes the world as a plane with 30 tiers or levels or dimensions or layers. And it's a fascinating concept here because it almost seems analogous to a simulation theory or a simulation model. But he's also friends with and was, a, was corresponding with Gerardus Mercator on the, and was an advisor on these English voyages of exploration. So I'm like, wait a minute here. Here he is connected to the whole um, process of describing the ball perfectly, cartography and, and advising in some capacity, which doesn't make sense. You've got some wizard in his tower advising you on your voyages. But at the same time, his own perspective on the world seemed to be completely different. But a fascinating character, still looking into it, and we'll continue to talk and develop on, on these various subjects because I haven't completely uh, ruled out, I don't ignore evidence, I don't ignore facts. So I don't rule out what, what would fall under the rubric of, of magic, what you would term that. I just, I'm not really quick to jump onto explanations that lean on the supernatural. But I do think that what we describe as magic is actually a technology that's yet to be properly defined, and likely, intentionally, and a product of us not having the words to describe it. You know, language control. They control the language, which is how they control our minds, and programming is a huge part of this. And deprogramming means introducing new words and concepts to describe what we're really seeing. Joined by Rome, says, I haven't caught a live in a while. Thank you for joining. This is where it's at, university protests. I don't get it. It seems very scripted. Yes, yes. This is just part of the college experience. This is what they're paying for. It's part of the immersive theater. And it's an obvious repeat of Occupy. The whole premise is, do you stand with the oppressed or the oppressor? Very basic, and I tend not to get involved. And the idea that the protesters are all victims of the police, I don't understand why people fall into it. It's not even about free speech at that point. You even get apologists. Protester apologists. It's bad enough that the left-wing media calls them peaceful. Oh, look at these peaceniks burning down a police precinct. Look at these peaceniks dragging people out of their cars and kicking them in the head. Like, I'm sorry, but that's not peaceful. But it's bad enough we expect that from the left because they are in uh, Wonderland. They're, they're in this, like, reverse, inverted reality. But on the right, you would think, okay, we understand speech should be protected, but that doesn't mean you get to engage in intimidation and reckless, destructive behavior and scaring people away from the campuses. But no, instead, their focus is, oh, look how mean the cops are. Sorry, the cops are doing their job. You know, take out the trash. You do what you have to do. You can't really argue with the way that they have to exercise it. But anyway, to me, protesters do not have the moral high ground, nor do they have the intellectual high ground. Uh, look at the environmentalists gluing themselves to planes, throwing soup at paintings, uh, lying on the streets and blocking traffic. Like, that type of behavior is outside of free speech and free expression. There are designated zones for that. And this doesn't make me a fascist. I, I don't know why we we are cowed 
by the irrational. Well, actually, I do know why. And it's because the mobs, the unthinking mobs, are the elite. The elite aren't just a small cabal at the top of the capstone somewhere. Nope. They are operating through every single programmed NPC out there. Continuing, uh, this is where it's at. It says, I caught that interview. Good stuff. All the Hollywood A-list is so intertwined. Oh, yes. Yes, Anx G agrees. Great chat about crypto Kubrology. What's so intriguing about this is that Kubrick is one of the clearest examples of a metascriptor, a human hand involved in the direction of the mass mind, of history. In other words, and this is why I think it's not difficult to grasp, I, I really take newsbenders literally that play about, oh, the news agencies are writing the news five years in advance. Well, that's the only way you could really truly steer history. And you just implement it on the world stage in a series of psyops, like a reality TV show. And then some will say, oh, that's crazy. There's no way that man could be scripting everything. Oh, really? Every single psyop is a pre-scripted event. Think about it. You know, um, it's pretty sophisticated. They've been doing this for decades. This is the principal weapon of mind war. It's time control. They control where we are in time. They can introduce people into the historical timeline. They write history. It almost doesn't matter how much we refute it, because they know in the end, their words are carved in stone. Ours are deleted. Elephant Tusk says, Columbia and Columbine must have some sort of connection. Yeah, we've been exploring this connection in our servers. The Columba is the name of the dove that carries the branch to Noah to signify the flood has ended. And the dove is another phoenix symbol. It's a symbol of revolution. Burn down, build back better, flood, flood it all wash it away, build back better from the Ark with a more purified version. The symbol of the dove, the symbol of the bat, the burning bat, the phoenix, uh, various ways they represent it are all signifying the same thing. It's all about the transition into the new age, burning down the old structures, iconoclasm, raising up the new goddess. It's like, okay, we're done with Virgin Mary, let's bring out Barbie and Barbie feminism. But we can also get rid of the patriarchy and masculinity is now toxic. The only male allowed is Ken, who's just a nub. And you know, at the end of the movie, he's still a nub. And she's a real woman and has to go see a... a, a, a the last word, the, the last word in the Barbie movie. Look at the script. The very last word. She's asking for a... She says, can I see a gynecologist? And that just underscores how the entire movie is layered in its meaning, but it's ultimately about the new goddess and the various euphemistic ways they talk about this. Um, this notion of, of course, the, the, the Holy Grail, the goddess, the whore of Babylon, it's all integrated into that movie. And it's not for children when you really get into this, the subtext and the real meaning of it all. But I, I would argue that uh, Barbie in that movie, Margot Robbie, is Marjorie Cameron. In the desert, 1946, Babylon working, the living portal through which the energies of the new Aeon are transmitted. And in the Barbie movie, it's all about the portal to Barbie land, which I say is Babylon, and introducing it into the world through California. And the movie is all about the chaos created when Barbie land merges with the world. And of course, I brought this up in my conversation with, the, uh, with Crypto K, because the movie opens with a 2001 space odyssey-like scene, but instead of a monolith, it's Barbie. And as she looks on, all these children, these girls with their dolls, begin bashing the baby heads of their dolls against the rocks because they're told that motherhood is a drag and it's better to just, you know, be a, a Barbie feminist. All right, let's continue here. This is where it's at. It says we're on a 24-year news cycle. They recycle these news stories. Yes, there are indications that everything is recycled, generational psyops, and there are patterns that we, we've picked up on that would suggest that there are reasons they do this. It's, for example, the new duck and cover is the school shooter. Same idea, duck and cover, submitting to the state. It's part of the MK Ultra processing of humanity. We've all been put through it. But we were noting many things. This is what led me to use the term Metascript that seemed to be repeats. You remember 19, the number 19, you had like C19, 
the Atlas comet breaking apart, preceding COVID-19. And this was 19 years after 19 hijackers did the whole 9-11 thing. And 9-11 was preceded by a really terrible movie called Pearl Harbor with Ben Affleck, in which you saw planes crashing into stuff and people joining to fight the war, very patriotic. And then 9-11 happens, and it's called This Generation's Pearl Harbor. So Pearl Harbor movie... 9-11 happens, it's this generation's Pearl Harbor, and they really emphasize it. That's how you're supposed to interpret it. That's how you're supposed to process what just happened. So they use the movies to drive the propaganda home. And, you know, something else I want to point out about propaganda and predictive programming, because we've been arguing against this case that propaganda is separate from predictive programming, that, you know, there are some, actually, it's, it's the majority belief among truthers that propaganda and predictive programming are two different things and anytime you see predictive programming it's it's coincidence it's synchronicity it was put there by some divine inspiration or a higher power or an ai so in other words the predictive programming that we're constantly analyzing as just standard operating procedure is still mystified by many people many people say there's no way man could coordinate all of this years in advance now, the reason why it's significant to me to, to bring this up, I mean, it's, it's important to bring this up, is that if you're ruling out the possibility it could be done by man, you're defaulting to the magical. Not only are you falling into the divine fallacy, but you're also exonerating the perpetrators. I've compared this to saying that computer hacking is beyond the capacity of man to do. It must be gremlins. Well, if you blame it on gremlins, you're never finding the hackers. And we're finding out who the reality hackers are. Not attributing this to some kind of higher power. So when it comes to predictive programming analysis, you have to keep in mind that it's not just the entertainment that predicts the stuff. There are drills. Every single major PSYOP you can point to had a concurrent drill going along with it. Whether it was at the same time, right before, a year before to the date, but you find this correspondence between simulating it and then it happens. So how do you explain that? Well, that's their pre-planned history. They're events that they're going to act out. They drill these things in advance. There were 88 drills going on on 9-11, all of them pertaining to what happened on 9-11. There were easily a thousand off-duty cops playing mass casualty victims on that day. So you can see that this is another indicator that there's nothing mystical about it. This is our history being acted out on the world stage. The fact that there are drills aren't coincidental alignments. It's not a coincidence there were drills that day. It's all integrated. And I use the word monolith. It's monolithic. And I do that as a nod to Kubrick. And Kubrick's movies predict a lot of the events in the 20th century, specifically 9-11, and it's not a coincidence that at Ground Zero on 9-11, looking over the, the dust, was the Hilton Monolith Millennium Motel, I mean hotel, the hotel that looks like a giant monolith. It's literally Kubrick's monolith at Ground Zero, which, as Crypto K points out, looks like the scene where the monolith is found on the moon. All right, let's continue here. Duis Impera says, he seems like a decently level-headed guy. Hope you'll have him back. Yes, and I hope you all took the, the links I posted, and that's why I have to upload it to my archives. I want to make sure everyone gets onto his Substack and Twitter account. Lean Dion says, I'm tired of beef in the Middle East. Shake my head, it's played out. Speaking of beef in the Middle East, when are they sacrificing the red heifers? Possibly the first non-nothing burger doomsday scenario in Jerusalem the red heifer okay this is the right wing extremists are going to sacrifice a red heifer outside some here it is it's going to serve as an atonement for the terrible consequences of the Israelites worshipping the golden calf and somehow this involves Texas because they supplied the red heifer and it's going to involve the destruction of a mosque and the building of a temple. It's supposed to happen very soon, and some believe that they can make it happen sooner if they sacrifice the cow. 
This is where it's at. It says they want to drill it in your head. Yeah, th this is the thing. Um, conditioning. Subconsciously, perhaps even, loading you, you know, um, getting you to accept something, some premise. Maybe just giving you the experience in advance in the form of a drill. You know, in your head, you're reenacting scenes. Perhaps you're even thinking hypothetically, how would you respond if buildings started crumbling? And then aliens invading. And in the movie, of course, they're look Independence Day. Aliens invade, buildings fall. Everybody looks to the president for leadership. And he assumes this, like, suddenly he's taken seriously. Kind of like George Bush after 9-11. Like, they use movies to frame your, your perspective for the next few years. That's why every single time a plane part falls or something blacks out, AT&T had the blackouts, or the boat, the boat, the dolly, the power went out and it hits the bridge. You know, every time this stuff happens, people say that's just like leave the world behind. And it is. And it's not just like leave the world behind, but it's like a lot of movies. And this is an intentional thing. And it's very specific. I mean, there is a continuous narrative thread that traces from that movie to the dolly hitting the Francis Scott Key Bridge and various things within the movie that explain the meaning of it, the symbolic meaning of it, and it's all symbolic. Not a coincidence, I don't think, that the boat's name is Dolly, the, the surrealist, because what are we looking at here? Uh, this is all art, it's all construct, and surrealism is also about symbolism and the language of the subconscious. But Francis Scott Key, National Anthem, has great significance to the present political climate, the dialectic between left and right, represented by 1776 and 1619, two years which were emphasized in the movie Leave the World Behind. Not a coincidence that at the Golden Gate Bridge, there is a monument to Francis Scott Key that was vandalized by BLM, removed and replaced by a monument to the 1619 arrival of White Lion. The White Lion carried the first group of um, transplanted, now enslaved Africans. And 1619, White Lion is referenced in Leave the World Behind because it's the boat, the White Lion, that loses power and crashes at the very beginning. 1619 is where the emergency signal is coming from. So the messaging there is very clear. 1619, America's reckoning, the boat crashing into the national anthem, is all told in the story of both the movie and in the crashing of the dolly into the Francis Scott Key Bridge. It's a continuous story. It's ongoing. Oswaldo says, can't use certain key words together, it seems like. Just misspell them, double a letter. So if you're trying to write something that's banned, just add an additional letter. Very simple. I don't believe in censorship here, but they do. That's one of YouTube's main features is guard railing ideas. They were instrumental in this operation of training the public to fear thought crimes, mind viruses. All right, let's continue. I want to go into my notes. We just barely got started. I want to make a quick point. Uh, Brian Unslaved said to me uh, regarding chemtrails, because I posted, I went out today for a hike, and I saw a lot of planes. Didn't see any trails. Is it because they weren't spraying today? And I realized, if you want to make a correlation here, there's definitely an indication that they only spray on humid days. They don't spray on days that aren't conducive to contrails. And my point being, of course, it's super clear sky, I see planes. What's more likely? That it's a weather phenomenon related to weather and climate? or that it's some pilot decide, deciding when to push the spray button and when not to. Like, we've already figured this out. Um, if you believe in chemtrails, that's the only thing you can do. You can only believe in them. You can believe in unicorns, too. You don't know it to be true. And you know you don't know it. You know you're merely a believer. And we have to make this distinction as we break away from belief systems and move into an operating system, a philosophical posture. So we're breaking away from the, the sky phobia. Well, a lot of sky phobics don't like it, and I said this was going to happen. I said, look, there are chemtrails over Trutherville. There are no chemtrails in the off-world stage. We have clear skies and beautiful contrails. 
but a lot of people are going to leave based on that and, and that's fine we need that to happen you do not want believers here's why knowers and seekers are outnumbered in this world like a thousand to one by blind faith believers and if you say we want a big tent there's not enough auto hoaxers here we're just a bunch of skeptics but we could have a lot more if we just let some believers in okay let's let chemtrail believers in well now suddenly we're outnumbered and we're outnumbered by chemtrail believers who fall for several logical fallacies including logical uh, logical uh, sorry um, uh, arguments from one the appeal to motive but more importantly loaded questions uh, shifting the burden of proof arguments from ignorance appeals to ignorance and so we can't have that because that'll bring in all kinds of other related beliefs and now suddenly we're squabbling again and we're trying to reach a state of purity so we're not going to break quarantine for anyone on on these grounds and here's an example of someone who can't handle me not believing what he believes and that's how believers are believers will throw you out if you don't believe what they believe so I have no problem, like it doesn't bother my conscience, that we're not letting them on the raft because they throw us off their little land whenever we contradict them um, really quickly. And look how quick this person is, as I'm saying. He said, you're denying what your eyes can actually see, and it demeans every other word that comes out of your mouth. Stop outthinking yourself. This cool truth or narrative that tries convincing people to disbelieve the only thing they should believe is tiring. You're muted for life. Done. So I'm muted because I'm denying the evidence of my eyes. Now what I want to say is that I'm not denying them. I'm just not mislabeling them. Nobody disputes the lines in the sky. Now we're disagreeing on the cause. So that's one. But two, denying your eyes is actually a fundamental part of skepticism. You can watch a magic show and believe your eyes if you want to. What happens if you go to a magic show? And you decide, I'm going to just believe my eyes. My eyes don't lie. Same problem that the Mandela affected have. My memory can't be tampered with, can't be interfered with. There's no such thing as misremembering. My memory is perfect. Really? And then you're like, well, you misspelled dilemma. And they're like, I didn't misspell it. The universe changed. All the dictionaries changed. I have it right. They can't admit when they're wrong. And that's typical of hardcore truthers. They can't admit that they've got duped by themselves once they realized that the media was duping them. And that's what happens. Mainstream media are duped by the media. I mean, the mainstream believers, they're duped by whatever they see. But the alternative people reject that. But they still manage to fall into the same traps. And it's because it's like do-it-yourself brainwashing. That's what alternative media is. Like, oh, we are the media now. We are the people's media. No, you're do-it-yourself brainwashing because you're being fed content that constitutes a state-approved, controlled narrative, controlled opposition narrative. And I've made this case many times, that chemtrails is right-wing climate change, like it or not. Now, my, my point here is this. You have to den deny your eyes to understand how the trick works. Your eyes will say, plane went across the sky and now it rained. Plane caused the rain. Your eyes will say, I boiled vinegar in my yard and now the skies are blue two hours later. Like, okay, if you just go by that in sequence and take it very simplistically, you might draw these erroneous conclusions. But, no, your eyes can be fooled, and you have to use your mind, and we are in a information war that relies on us falling for what I call sleight of mind. So sleight of mind is similar to an optical illusion. It's just the way they trick you based on your perspective or the premise they get you to accept the loaded question. So anyway, Brian Unslaved has muted me for life because I've told him the truth. And he is stuck on a belief. And that's fine. No loss. Catching up on comments. Dua Sampera says, was thinking though, how does skywriting work? Now they do it with drones. But, you know, people will mention skywriting. They'll mention cloud seeding it's like i don't believe in chemtrails they'll say well you're so you're denying cloud seeding it's like these are two different things 
and it is interesting to consider but um, one point is this sky writing means or in, it involves um, releasing something into the sky uh, contrails are not the same thing they're not releasing anything into the sky so much as the heat from the exhaust is interacting and in certain climactic conditions will condense but not on all days like today there were no contrails so am I supposed to believe oh they just didn't spray today because it's what? what what's so special about today that they didn't spray and it happens to be an exceptionally hot and dry day the correlation between climate and contrails has been established for decades so anyone arguing otherwise is arguing in ignorance of this fact and that's unconscionable if you're arguing in ignorance of an established fact and you haven't confronted the fact then you're either afraid of being wrong or you're belligerently ignorant and you're no longer caring about truth and that's the position of the average climate change believer who used to they have to change their lies because they're no longer believable do you remember when the ocean levels were rising nobody talks about that anymore why because it obviously wasn't happening and they have to change the lie move the goalpost I mean I admit it did go about I think the oceans rose about a millimeter in 2020 2021 but that was from 57 tons of PPE dumped into the ocean ironically by the people who believe in global warming that's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy believers in global warming you know actually causing the ocean levels to rise in that way Dewis and Paris says is Brian unslaved a minion of that boisterous and annoying Paul unslaved well they're both enslaved to fear they're both enslaved to propaganda fears where now they're scared of the sky and look you're a coward if you're a chemtrail believer and you haven't glued yourself to an airplane if you haven't vandalized a priceless work of art if you haven't laid down in the middle of the road to stop cars if you haven't set yourself on fire at a tennis match you're a coward if you haven't obtained a large audience and cajoled everyone with how dare you for not believing then you're a coward like I'm just saying climate change activists have a lot more to stand on than chemtrail believers because actually they're doing something about it all right let's continue uh, thank you very much thirst for truth the IPS appreciates the support do us some says I'm imagining research chemtrails written in the sky well the, the whole chemtrail theory is very slippery and I, I find it really entertaining because it's like a chess game and I know their moves so they're gonna say chemtrails and they'll point to regular airplane spraying stuff and I'll say well that's condensation trails and they'll say I wasn't talking about that I meant the secret planes the invisible ones that nobody sees but me and not the regular contrails but the ones that linger so now they they throw in all kinds of I mean it's like mental gymnastics so now they've contorted it so now they're gaslighting you and lying actually so it's curious to me what the incentive is for lying so then you debunk that and they say oh no that's misinformation I'm talking about the stratospheric aerosol injections that nobody sees okay so now we're not even talking about airplanes now we're no longer talking about contrails now you're talking about something we don't see it's like how is that different than saying co2 is killing Gaia same thing and I was surprised today to hear Alex Jones talking about 5G towers like oh, we got to do something about 5G tower oppression we're being oppressed by 5G towers going up everywhere and we're dying because of it and he just throws it out there and nobody questions it it's like should I now be looking you know sideways at 5G towers There's one outside my window should I move what do I wear you know, should I wear a mask for chemtrails should I have a aluminum foil coated umbrella when I pass by the 5G tower like there's just so much to be afraid of maybe I should just lock myself down maybe I should just go into the basement and watch friends from season one all the way to the end just like Rose and leave the world behind and I'll behold the end war live on big screen and I won't leave my house because of chemtrails and 5g towers 
Upside down guy, phone line off. Uh, no, let me turn the phone on if you want to call in. Upside down guy has gifted 10 memberships. Portal Complex, AJ206. Enslaved by Truth. Ultimate TV 9000. It's Snoopy. The Gray Bush. Elephant Tusks. All Blue Wrench Lodge. Oswaldo says this gifting memberships is a hack for outing lurkers. Yeah, it really is. Okay, phones are going to turn on here in just a moment. Let me get the get the ringer turned on. Heads up, it's kind of loud. I'm going to do my best to, to mute it. But it's on my screen. So if you're calling in, I will see the signal here. Now, chemtrails is boring, but deconstructing psychological operations is not. And it's beyond just being right. We're not trying to say, this is what you should believe, this is what you shouldn't believe. I'm suggesting that we should all be non-believers. Why would you want to be a believer in the age of information when you should be able to know what is knowable? We have to make that distinction because the world is drowning in mis, dis, and malinformation intended to keep people disconnected from objective reality. Okay, phones are open, and I definitely appreciate the continued membership. Do us in Paris as 5G is yesterday's fear. 6G is all the rage now. And that's just going to move. And I've had people make these arguments, like, well, you don't know that it's not harmful. Okay, well, if you're just taking precautions, then where's your helmet? Where's your chemtrail mask? Where's your aluminum, aluminum foil or your 5G protective undergarments? to prevent you from being sterilized, because that's one of their fears. It's like, where is there any evidence that you are taking precautions for the things that you're afraid of? And what they'll say is, well, I'm not afraid. Oh, so you're a brave person warning me about chemtrails. You're brave. But you're not brave enough to call the airlines and complain. You're awful passive. I would almost say cowardly. I would be embarrassed of myself if I believed in chemtrails and I didn't have the guts to protest at an airport or at least to hand out pamphlets to tell people not to fly because they're killing their children. Like, if I didn't have the guts to warn my fellow human beings about this dangerous threat to their existence, I don't know. I would be, I would hang my head low. I'd be like, I am so cowed. We're being victimized. Just look up. But I'm not willing to do, I'm not willing to go stand on a street corner and warn people. Like, that's pathetic. I'm sorry, but I'm losing respect for chemtrail believers because all they can do is tweet about it. Okay. New cannibal story. Murder suspect ate victims' his eyes and ears after killing him. This is in Las Vegas. My favorite cannibalism story recently, I think, is the one in Los Angeles where the guy's just eating it raw. The guy, someone gets hit by a train and he grabs the leg and he's on video eating it. Suspected murderer accused of killing another man at a, dust, at a bus stop near Las Vegas Strip and eating parts of his face. So he was on top of him eating him 45 minutes later. 29-year-old Colin Check kneeling next to the victim with biological matter in his hair and mouth and clothing. The victim was later pronounced dead, Kenneth Brown. Okay. Interesting story. This is where it's asked, says, gifting memberships may vet and drive out bots. Well, you know what, what? It's true, because what I can do in the future is I could quite easily stream on YouTube and put the settings so that only members can comment. So we can definitely implement that. We kind of do it anyway by handing out blue wrenches. Okay, so phones are open. It is Witches Night, uh, 4.30, 2024. Tomorrow is May Day, International Workers' Day, major communist holiday. And communist, I use lower C, we're referring to collectivism, the elimination of private property, worship of the state, basically the ideals that the left and incidentally the space program are leading us to. It, it really does end in space. you got to look at space communism. Red Star, 1908, must read. Diana South says, protest Pete Buttigieg, transportation secretary about chemtrails. Well, someone took chemtrails to court 
and someone passed a, some bill just to placate their base. And it doesn't mean they're real. Like, that's the thing. They don't exist. Chemtrails don't exist. And if you're a chemtrail believer, and you're willing to say you believe in it, but you're not willing to stand on a street corner and warn people, then you're a pathetic excuse for a human being. I'm sorry to put it like that, but think about it. You're, if you're asserting that we're being poisoned and you're not taking action, what's wrong with you? If somebody's house is burning, are you going to at least call 911? You see somebody getting beaten in a subway, are you going to be somebody recording it with your phone? Or are you going to intervene? I just expect more out of people. And if you're saying that bad pilots are dumping poisons on the playgrounds, then you better call those airlines and do something. If you're not, then what's wrong with you? I, I really have a lot more respect now for the climate change activists. At least they act in concert with their beliefs, as erroneous as those beliefs may be. Alright, let's move on. NYPD arrests 133 protesters at NYU pro-Palestine rally. So 133 stood out to me because the gunmen killed 133 at Crocus City Hall. So 133, 133, and then I see this. Israel PM says Rafa attack will go ahead with, no, this is the headline. Ceasefire deal, 133 hostages in Gaza. So 133 hostages in Gaza, 133 killed in Crocus City, and then 133 protesters arrested. So 133, 133, 133. What is the significance here? Uh, I could point to a few things. Psalm 133 is the one that the Masonic Bible is open to during Lodge. 133 figured prominently around the whole Nipsey Hussle death hoax. 331, 1. Three, three. So there's something there, but just pointing it out, there's something here worth looking at. Uh, repeated numbers are one of the things we tend to pick up on. Something else, Time Magazine has Trump on it, and Trump actually shared this one. It says, if he wins, and what do you notice here? Donald Trump has horns. Not a new thing. They do this quite often. Rome says, can you take a membership away or block a member if a troll somehow gets one? I'm certain that's possible. Okay, Ringer is on. It says you're calling anonymously. And I don't think I blocked anybody recently. It says no answer. You know, okay, look, it did ring. It just says no answer. That's me. I don't know what the deal is, but Skype is acting really funny. So I'm going to do an outbound call if you want to call me back if it doesn't ring so anyway we're looking at this image of Donald Trump with horns and then P. Trippa in our Gilded remarks that it reminds him of his favorite sculpture by Michelangelo he says the Time magazine cover reminds me of my favorite sculpture Moses by Michelangelo and Moses of course has horns if you've seen this sculpture. And there's a couple different explanations for the reason why Moses has horns, which I've, I've looked into this before. Um, but one of the main things that stood out to me about this is that Trump has been compared to Moses recently by none other than Jim Quiviesel from Sound of Freedom. Big QAnon guy. He played Jesus when he was 33 in the Mel Gibson film Passion of the Christ. Now, not only did he play Jesus during uh, and act as Jesus during Passion of the Christ, but when he was delivering the Sermon of the Mount, Jim Caviezel delivering sermon, uh, sermon on the Mount as Jesus is on his fifth take. So the fifth time delivering this sermon, Jesus, a.k.a. Jim Caviezel, gets struck by lightning and he dies. So he died on the movie set and they brought him back to life. That happened, 33-year-old J.C. Jim Caviezel. Then later he comes back with this whole Q thing. And this is part of why the Q movement worships Mel Gibson, like he's some kind of savior. That he's some kind of Hollywood whistleblower. They have their own little interesting world, their whole, the QAnon universe. It's a fictional universe. 
has all its its cast of you know heroes and villains and demons. But anyway, Jim Caviezel called Donald Trump the new Moses. And I remember thinking about this because on the 55th anniversary of MLK's assassination, Trump was being arrested. And so he's already being compared to Jesus. This is during Holy Week. He was actually mocked as Jesus on SNL. Last Supper. There's like a Last Supper scenario they played. My point is, they've already did this Christ typology. So we've already seen this sort of apotheosis of Donald Trump. But then on the 55th anniversary of MLK's assassination, he is arrested. Well, MLK has been compared in some ways to Moses with his conversation about the promised land and you know his, his final speech before he died, before he was assassinated there at Mason Temple. So we're, we're looking at this parallel here between Trump and MLK because at that time there were a lot of conversations, a lot of subject, a lot of people in the media were talking about a Trump assassination. So Trump assassination was really hot last year and some had remarked, and this even came from Charlie Kirk, that we that Trump may not live to see MAGA fully implemented. He may not live to see his MAGA, his promised land. So this connection between Trump and Moses had already kind of existed there. So it's just kind of interesting to see him here with horns. So here's from USA Today. This is the new Moses, Caviezel said. I mean, I'm still Jesus, but he's Moses. Pharaoh, let my children go free. Remember, save the children. Trump has often ranked himself among historical greats like President Abraham Lincoln. Fancy you'd compare yourself to someone who gets a headshot. And he's already compared to JFK by his diehard MAGA cult followers. Some believe he is JFK in a Trump suit. But hearing a movie star compare him to a figure of biblical proportions is something else. Okay, phones are open, 505-349-0420. If you're having a hard time getting through the phones, just download the Skype app. It's Infinite Plane Radio. Peter Territory says, Back to the Future Lone Pine Mall sign had 1.33 a.m. time. Good to know. And Back to the Future has plenty of predictive programming for 9-11. This has been discussed at length, but also for Donald Trump. Donald Trump is Biff Tannen, and the writer of Back to the Future consciously designed Biff Tannen off of Donald Trump. We're living right now in the timeline where Biff Tannen is basically in control of the world or whatever. He's in his tower. It's basically Trump right now. Biff Tannen. Oswaldo says, wrench are confiscatable, unlike AR-15s. Yes. Alright, there's something else that came up today I wanted to get into. It has to do with nukes. Because they're preparing us, obviously. They're preparing us. Here it is. This is it. So this was a another comment by P. Trippa. He said, on public TV, the government is debating on space-based threats, nukes in space versus U.S. Now, I want to point out, this was the story in the movie ISS, which came out on 119. Countermeasures, needs, concerns, etc. are mentioning it to you because they've used this phrase, quote, this is like the missile crisis in space. Oh, the Cuban missile crisis in space. That's how they're framing it. So they're framing this as another Cuban Missile Crisis, quote, more data lending to a JFK connection, but who knows. For now it's comedy, however, maybe there's some communication between governments to prepare for something. Interesting. Not sure what I'm trying to say makes sense, but how do they do a nuke from space? Just the whole thing, making it, detonating it, fallout. I ask that fully knowing it's fake, but I'm guessing at some point they're going to have to firebomb someplace and call it a nuclear explosion. How would they do something like this? Put some sort of explosives on a blimp or plane that's already high? Or is this like a way to simply say something's in space but nothing's really there? 
Okay, these are all valid questions. And, you know, one of the things that I kind of lamented when I was a film studies major is how we were transitioning from real special effects, organic props, theatrical blood, pyrotechnics into the digital, which didn't have the same quality. And I thought, this is a real bad decision here to sacrifice quality on a work of art that's meant to be timeless for these cheap special effects. You know, save time, save money, sure, but is it worth it? And at the time, I, I was really kind of dejected by the whole thing. I was not into the CGI, which has evolved over time, and it's certainly eclipsed what they've used before. So to answer this question, I would have thought they're going to fake it with CGI, possibly, because that's just what they've moved us into. But then I thought Oppenheimer was done on IMAX film. And by the way, it was 11 miles long and weighed 600 pounds. Oppenheimer's film, the movie, 11 miles long, 600 pounds, 11.6. 11.6 and 6.11 are both positively correlated with the nuke in all kinds of predictive programming. Oppenheimer wore a badge that was K6. K is 11 and 6. So 11.6, very common. But my point being, this movie was filmed on IMAX, and they used real props. They didn't just do it all in CGI. And why is that? Why do they blow up Barbie, Barbie doll houses? You know, why do they have to use real props? To make it realer. And that's because there is a qualitative difference in reality between the synthetic and you know, these, these real props, miniatures, compared to just doing it all in the simulation. And I thought, well, maybe this is the strategy. Because the special effects guru for 2001 A Space Odyssey, Douglas Trimble, who died a couple of years ago, he was in an interview where he said that his special effects from 50 years ago have aged well, contrasted with CGI effects from five years ago that do not compare to the latest iterations of CGI special effects. And I thought, well, maybe what they were doing intentionally is dumbing us down visually by switching over to CGI, turning all these action movies into just basically comic books, animation, cartoon, cartoon violence. Maybe this was a deliberate strategy to further divorce us from reality so that when they want to fake something and make it believable, then they can bring out the old school special effects with props. So in other words, the Oppenheimer movie might be a clue that when they do it with nukes maybe they're going to fake it with organic special effects and they will do real firebombing maybe they won't just go cheap but my point being here is that um, whatever they do we don't have to see it we're going to see it on tv but i suspect they're going to make it as realistic as can possibly be to contrast with all the science fiction that we've seen where it's clearly fake i mean even fallout by christopher nolan's brother jonathan nolan Fallout is clearly comic booky in its depiction. But now to continue, you know, we're we're talking about nukes and how are they gonna fake nukes. And one of the other things here to to um mention is how are they gonna fake Fallout? And it got me thinking about this movie called The Humanity Bureau from twenty seventeen with Nicolas Cage, where man is locked down because we had some civil war and there's radiation, there's fallout everywhere. And you're not supposed to have Geiger counters. Those are contraband. Well, someone gets their hands on one, and they find out that they're locked down for no reason. An unbelievable script, obviously. They could never do that. But as far as this goes, what was brought up in our discussion was, well, if this is the case, then wouldn't we be able to, to prove it false? Like, hey, guys, it's safe to come out. We have a test. We have a, a Geiger counter here. We can test for ourselves. Well, not so fast, because you can already see how they are preparing us by setting the stage and setting our expectations. Neil deGrasse Tyson was recently on Bill Maher's show, and they were talking about nuclear weapons. Tyson said, quote, Modern nukes don't have the radiation problem. They're a different kind of weapon than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When pressed by Maher, he said, there's no radiation issue if it's hydrogen bombs. So they've already set the stage here for us to say, hey, this seems fake. Doesn't seem like there's enough, because there will be people who doubt it.
Gables 10 says, major tornadoes in Oklahoma right now. Anticyclonic twisters shocking the meteorologist. Tornadoes moving almost standstill under 20 miles per hour. One tornado did a complete 360 on the radars live on TV. Now, I'm glad you brought this up because when I watch these movies, like I recently watched Civil War, I go early so I can catch all the trailers. And that's because the trailers are usually part of the programming and they usually reinforce it or they they give you more information and one of the trailers that I watched was for a 2024 action thriller called Twisters so it's a tornado movie cli-fi climate fiction and I thought wait a minute here why are they releasing Twisters a tornado movie this summer and I thought what they're probably gonna do is like what they did last year with train derailments or this year with planes they will hyper focus on tornadoes and blow it up and they may even be able to fake a few how would you know so I'm, I look at everything on the news as questionable there may be a tornado everybody's locked down and then you get some footage some rare footage that only a few people have seen and you don't know if it's real so could we have a CGI tornado to augment real bad weather absolutely they can turn a spring rain into a hurricane if they have a reporter leaning into the wind. You've all seen these reports where these news, these news crews are out there leaning over into the tornado or into the hurricane. And then you see these joggers in the background or a couple holding hands, walking their dog, standing up vertical. Or you see a reporter up to his waist in water and then someone else is walking ankle deep. And it's like, okay, this guy's obviously... Um, exaggerating in some way, crouching, kneeling. They will fake bad weather for special effects. They will have their camera shaking. They'll have, take it off the tripod, make it look more dramatic. So they're constantly, I, I guess it's psyoping the weather. So when I saw that, I thought, well, watch, there's going to be a bunch of tornadoes suddenly hyper-focused upon. So in other words, tornadoes as usual, but now it's mainstream news, so it seems like it's a bigger deal than it is. Elephant Tusk says, have you watched Donnie Darko 2001 versus 2004? Apparently the differences are astounding. I deliberately didn't watch the second one because I thought it would ruin the first, but I will have to watch it now, now that you brought it up. Because Donnie Darko is incredibly significant. I mentioned ISS coming out on 119, about the space station falling from the sky or breaking apart, war up above. Donnie Darko came out on 119 as well. And it's about a plane falling from the sky. The director's father is with NASA and worked on the Mars program for the Viking rover. So you have a NASA movie maker whose son makes a movie chock full of predictive programming for 9-11 and for 2020 for Donald Trump. If you didn't know, Donnie Darko in a subtextual way is Donald Trump. And it conveys a lot of interesting messaging. But more relevantly now, leave the world behind's character Rose, the one who goes into the bunker and watches Friends. Uh, she's referred to derisively by other characters as Donnie Darko because of how weird she is. And I don't think that's insignificant considering that the movie had a lot of planes falling from the sky. A lot of overlapping themes here. There, there's a few overlapping themes. I mean, Donnie Darko has some Alice in Wonderland connections as well. Uh, he's a sleepwalker, is a, a bunny that's telling him he's running out of time. Very, very interesting movie in itself. I'll have to revisit that. Oswaldo says, Batman showed us how to get rid of a nuke with no autopilot. Now, speaking of that, on, on Dark Knight Rising, you know, you have the Batman burning bat symbolism, forecasting COVID. You have a character with no mask, and Batman says, put on your mask. It's not for you. It's to protect the people you love. You know, for, foreshadowing 10 years in advance, Fauci's lines. But even in that movie, Batman says, count down to five and throw this. So he throws a smoke bomb after counting down to, from five, and it makes a mushroom cloud. So Christopher Nolan foreshadows his own mushroom cloud movie years in advance but there was a countdown from five which got me thinking covid 
And then, of course, the smoke bomb was shaped like a COVID spiked ball. Countdown five years. So I'm thinking 2019, 2020, we're in that window where the fake nuke will be implemented within the next year.